Hey guys, welcome to AIT 1002 Power and Development. My name is Mike Deal. I'm going to be your instructor for this class. And we're going to break this class into about four sections. Uh, we're going to talk about um, <clears throat> sources of power. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the development of AC power through alternators. Okay, um, And you probably immediately start thinking alternators on your car. Uh, we are going to kind of use that as a model, but know that the uh, same principles apply in the big power industry, uh, the fact that the power plants that you go by, you see the smokestacks and everything going down the road, uh, those operate on the exact same principle as the alternator in your car uh, uses. But we're gonna talk a lot about that and we're gonna go in pretty good detail about that. We're also gonna cover some DC, and we're not gonna talk about DC generators, um, but rather we're gonna talk about how we rectify AC and uh, give us a DC signal that we use throughout industry. And then finally, we're gonna be talking about uh, three-phase motors and motor control that, that runs all of our industry and factories and manufacturing as well. Okay, but uh, we're going to start with, uh, first of all, we're going to start with the uh, sources of electricity. Now before we move on, I want to let you know you need to be taking notes when you watch this lecture. Okay, you also need to be taking notes in your reading or some highlighting or whatever helps you to retain uh, what it is you're reading and understand and comprehend it. Okay. And then finally, um, you're going to need to take notes when you come to lab, okay? Uh, when you do these labs, you're going to have some answers and some uh, things, and all of these will show up on the quiz. Now, the quiz is not the end-all and be-all, but you've got to do more than just sit there and watch me talking to you and lecturing, okay? You've got to get engaged. You've got to take these notes, because I promise you, you're not, this, you're not going to see this and it go away. All of our classes in AIT build on one another, okay? We're still in the fundamental level here. So what we see now, you are going to see further down the road. So this is not a, a watch it and forget it kind of thing, uh, just to take the test. This is going to be used and applied over and over and over in the AIT program. So just want to let, give you a heads up to do that. So with that, let's go ahead and get started with power development. Okay, We use power in the United States uh, all, and globally, but we use electricity. Uh, all over the United States. It powers the, our cities, our lights, our infrastructure, our transit systems, things like that. Uh, it powers our factories uh, where we manufacture everything. And we also we use it for simple things like powering our cell phones, uh, or charging our cell phones, and our iPads, our tablets, and our PCs, and things like that. All of this is, it uses electricity, okay? And it all comes from, uh, basically in the United States, from our power grid, okay? And we're gonna drill down and get to that. But right now, we're going to kind of take an overview just uh, for this particular uh, lecture on the sources of electricity, okay? And there are five major sources of electricity. The first one we're going to talk about is chemical energy. And then we're going to get into light energy. Then we're going to talk about energy created from, power, uh, from pressure. And then we're going to talk about energy and electricity created from heat. And then magnetism. Now, magnetism is the one we're going to go into most uh, in depth in this class, okay? Uh, not this particular lecture, but we are going to spend a lot of time on how magnetism uh, impacts our, our, our electricity period and production of it and also the consumption, okay? So let's get started with, first of all, talking about chemical energy. Chemical energy, most common thing that you've probably ever seen. Uh, chemical energy used is in the form of a battery, okay? Nine volt, your car battery, uh, different specialized batteries, okay? Um, I use this particular uh, <coughs> uh, uh, circular type battery, uh, I use it in my guitar tuner, okay? Uh, lights up and tells me if I got some strange out of tune or anything like that, but a real small three volt battery, use that, okay? And we get voltage and, and power, and or we get electricity out of the battery when chemicals react with different types of metals, okay? What happens is it allows the electrons to, to be released and it flows from one metal to the other and that's where we get that flow of electricity when we hook it to a device, whatever it may be, okay? But the main thing here is we have chemicals that react with the, with, with the, device, with the uh, metals inside a battery, okay? And that battery produces DC electricity or direct current. Now you're going to hear a lot uh, about DC, direct current, and AC, alternating current. AC does not stand for air conditioning, by the way. Uh, not in my class, it doesn't. So anyway, we're going to talk about DC uh, a lot, okay? Now again, as I said, you've, you've probably seen the most common place you've seen is in the batteries. But <clears throat> uh, I remember as a kid, uh, they used to have, they'd have the science fair, okay? And invariably, some kid 
would come up with a source of electricity using some piece of citrus fruit, mostly uh, a lemon. But remember I told you that you had uh, dissimilar metals, two different types of metals, okay, and they were in some form of chemical, and that chemical allowed the flow of electrons, to release electrons from one source, I mean one form of metal to the other. And that's where we got our flow. Well, the same thing, you can, you can do this actually with an orange. I don't know if you guys have ever tried this or not before, but basically, in these science projects that they would do for the science fair, okay, these experiments, uh, they would have a lemon because it had the most citric acid, the highest level of citric acid, and they would take a piece of copper, mostly a, a penny, okay. Interesting little fact here. Uh, the most pure pennies uh, came from before 1982. For, and from 1982 onward to now, they started making them with a lot more zinc, okay. So they would take, that's a little tidbit, thought you might enjoy that. Uh, anyway, they take a piece of copper, of a copper that's mostly in the penny, okay, and they would stick it in the lid, and they would take an iron that's zinc coated, okay. So now you've got zinc and you've got copper. Those are your dissimilar metals, the two different types of metals. And <clears throat> the citric acid, the acid, uh, the, the juice inside the lemon was the electrolyte, okay. Now that's the chemical that allows the electron flow to go from the zinc nail over to the copper penny, okay. So the citric acid is the electrolyte. That's the chemical, okay that allows the flow of electricity and sure enough they would have some little meter or something that just put out a very very small uh, amount of voltage but it always showed up at every science fair anyway you can actually make voltage out of a lemon or a lime or an orange even okay but anyway um, going back to a more practical way of producing chemical energy uh, with, again with the batteries the most common is the primary cell type of battery okay that's a that's something you might want to pay attention to, okay? Primary cell. Now, the, the most uh, <clears throat> predominant characteristic of a primary cell battery is that it is not rechargeable, okay? It comes in all kinds of different sizes. It's got uh, AA, AAA, C, D, you got a nine volt square and everything. But the primary cell is not rechargeable, okay? And again, just a couple of examples. Here's the nine, the D, and that special uh, uh, little cylindrical uh, battery, okay? We also have secondary cells. Now, its primary characteristic is that it is rechargeable. We see a lot of these in rechargeable tools, particularly from like DeWalt and uh, uh, Hitachi and things like that, where uh, <clears throat> you have these these uh, special batteries that can be recharged. Uh, most of them are made of nickel cadmium, or we call those NICADs, okay, or lithium ion. Uh, you see a lot of these uh, rechargeable tools with lithium ion batteries, long life and rechargeable. One of the great characteristics of secondary cell uh, batteries. Okay, we also have the wet cell battery. Now you've seen these under the hood of your car, or on your four wheeler, your tractor, or whatever the case may be. But they're the wet cell. And <clears throat> remember, we talked about the electrolyte, well, or that chemical. All right. Well, the wet cell battery uses an acid to help transfer the the electron flow uh, from one type of metal to the other inside a battery. Okay. It's more robust. It's heavier duty. Um, you know, you can have a. You can these batteries here. Uh, you can, you can, this is a nine volt battery, but you can set, stack a series of these up and make twelve volts. But they don't have the capacity or the ampacity that this battery has right here because it's got it's a lot more heavy duty, a lot more robust. But we use these in automotive automotive uh, uh, places. We also use them in aviation. Um, I, my first career was in aviation. I was an uh, airplane helicopter mechanic. And we used to have NICAD batteries also because uh, they were rechargeable. Some of them had wet cell. We use them in, in agriculture for your tractors and also in for marines, particularly like trolling motors and things like that. They have to have a long duty cycle. Uh, so you use those in marine uh, applications as well. But those are wet cells. Uh, pretty much on wet cells anymore, you don't do any maintenance to them. Um, used to be you could take the caps off of each individual cell uh, and you could. Uh, draw out some of the acid in a hydrometer, read the specific gravity to see if the cell is good or see if it needed more water or anything like that. Uh, but uh, any, any more now, they're all maintenance free, so really don't do that unless they are specialized, like I said, for uh, aircraft purposes and things like that. Okay? Now, we're moving on to the next source of energy that we have, and that is solar or light energy. Okay? This is starting to become more and more prevalent uh, in our area particularly. Okay? Uh, the, the proper name or the correct term that you use, you'll see a lot, is photovoltaic, okay? Photo meaning light and voltaic meaning voltage, okay, or power, 
all right? And it's also abbreviated PV, okay? It's photovoltaic. And the most common thing, uh, photovoltaic uh, energy you see is in solar panels, okay? And we're starting to see more and more of them around here. We've got some on the back of our maintenance building out here behind the AIT shop. And so uh, we've got, uh, you know, we're starting to see more and more. The, also, the price of this technology is coming down. It used to be kind of cost prohibitive uh, and too expensive, but now the cost is starting to come down. You get some breaks from the power companies if you want to install them and things like that. So we're starting to see more and more of them. And basically how these work, okay, is that sunlight is absorbed by a silicon crystal, okay? And I'm not going to go into real de detail or depth about this, but the silicon, when, when the sunlight hits that silicon crystal, it will start releasing uh, atoms and the uh, negatively charged uh, electrons will start to flow, which is basically electricity, okay? And like the uh, chemical energy uh, sources from the batteries that we saw, the, ele the electricity that comes from our solar panels is DC, direct current, okay? It's not alternating current, we haven't got there yet, but we get DC voltage out of our uh, solar panels. Okay, now we can do a couple of different things with the DC voltage coming uh, from our solar panels. Number one, we can store them in batteries. Now, some, in some uh, residential uh, applications, they will have a bank of batteries that sunlight is storing these batteries, and if they ever lose power in a storm or for whatever reason, they've got charged batteries ready to light up or, or power the essential things that they may need in their house. Okay, now that's added cost because you've got to have batteries and things like that. Um, another thing that people are starting to do, or that have been doing for some time, I should say, um, they are taking that DC voltage and putting it back on the grid. Now, they're not putting DC back on the AC grid. The, you know, your vo the voltage, your power in your house is alternate current, AC. You can't mix these two. So what you have to do is you have to run the DC voltage through an inverter. We're not going to get into real detail about this just yet. But run through an inverter that converts it back to AC. To, or to AC, and then you can tie it into uh, your power coming to your house. Basically what that does is sort of counters the amount of uh, power that you're needing from the power company. It sort of feeds it back so it lessens the amount of power that's that you're going to be charged for, okay? And so the more power you create through solar panels and things like that, uh, and that you feed to the grid, okay, or in, or the, in your house there, okay, the less you're going to consume from the power company, so it starts to uh, decrease your monthly cost. In fact, I know a guy that's got some solar panels up on his house right now, and his power bill is running roughly about uh, 11 to $14 a month, and he's got a lot of solar panels. He's got a lot invested in those solar panels, too, to get that low uh, power bill. But yeah, that's what's happening, is he's feeding it back to the grid, and uh, so there's, right now there's some controversy because power companies are wanting to, to uh, penalize those who are using solar energy uh, because they're now not making as much money, so go figure. Anyway, uh, like I said, the the, elect, the uh, voltage coming from the uh, solar panels from our photovoltaic sources is DC. Okay. Now, there's a couple of things that impact how much voltage uh, and also how much power uh, we get from a solar panel. Number one is the light intensity. Most of the um, the solar farms where there are huge uh, arrays of solar panels. Most of the solar farms are in the southwestern part of the United States where the sunlight is much more abundant, where, it, where it's closer to the sun. It's, a little, it's, it's, it's hotter, okay, uh, and there's more, the light intensity is much greater, okay, so that helps out. It's, you're going to see a lot more of those in the southwest than you are in the northeast around Maine and Massachusetts and places like that. They have them, but uh, they don't get nearly the sunlight uh, as you do out west, okay. So uh, the other thing that impacts is, is the surface area of the photocell, okay? Or for photocells, you can tie these things together in series, all right? That's why I have the or photocells. But the surface area uh, of a photocell, back to our pen right here, the surface area of each one of these photocells, how much surface area that there is being exposed to the sunlight impacts how much voltage you are going to be able to create. And also the distance from the sun. Or, or our light source. I keep saying sun, which is primarily the most practical uh, way of, of getting voltage from these. But uh, from our light source, uh, how far it is uh, has a big impact on how much power we're creating. Okay? Uh, your most practical applications that you've probably seen 
is some of these yard lights that light up flower beds or uh, landscaping or sidewalks and things like that. These are little photo cells right here. And <clears throat> these are standalone, meaning that you don't have to hook them to any power source, you know, any uh, household power source or anything like that. You just take them, plop them in the ground, and these photo cells will take the light energy from the sun and charge a small battery inside here. Now, they're not using a regular light, they're using the LED because LED lights are very efficient and use very little power and make the most of the battery that's, that's uh, in the lights. But these photo cells are providing a voltage that are recharging the batteries. Okay, so at daytime, you get a lot of sunlight, you're charging that battery when the sun goes out, or the sun goes down, the lights come on, and the batteries will power them throughout the night. Usually by the morning they're kind of weak, but the sun comes up, recharge them, and we just start the whole cycle again. Also, you might, driving down the road, you might have seen some of these uh, uh, highway signs, traffic signs. Uh, these photo cells right here, uh, like the, just like the yard lights, you can take these and plant them anywhere without having to have an external uh, power source. You don't have to look for a place to plug these up. Also, you don't have to have a diesel, gener uh, diesel driven generator, uh, a lot of noise, smoke, and fuel consumption, okay? So this is, these are sources of free energy that we use to, uh, in this case, uh, uh, supply the power to this road sign to tell us how fast we're going. But again, and they can pick it up, trailer it to somewhere else, set it up, they're good to go, kind of point toward the sunlight and you're ready to go, okay? So they're very mobile, uh, very practical. But those are a couple of, of examples that you have probably seen photo sales if you've not seen these big uh, uh, solar farms. A lot more people are putting these on their homes as well. Again, they're wanting to back feed the power grid and get their power bill down. Um, again, these, uh, the, the price for the technology has dropped dramatically over the last seven, eight, nine years, something like that. And uh, so more, people, more and more people are able to afford it to put on their homes, put them out on their barns and agriculture. And also, um, you'll start, this is something you see out west and also in Europe, they're very popular in Europe but they're <clears throat> solar farms and the amount of power can, can, uh, that these solar farms uh, can produce can really uh, help support large cities' electrical demand, okay? Now, granted, it takes up a lot of land, but you know, particularly out there in the southwest when the, the desert land, things like that, uh, there's not a lot of uh, building or anything like that, obstruction that these are gonna cause. So solar farms are very popular that way uh, and they produce a lot of power, okay? The next one we're going to talk about is pressure. We're going to spend a whole lot of time on this one, but um, just want you to know that you can use some force uh, to create a voltage or a, a, a uh, or power. Okay, and you do that. It's known as piezoelectricity or piezo effect. Okay, or piezoelectrical effect. All right, and basically you apply pressure to crystals that are in this device right here. For example, and when you put pressure on these crystals, it creates a voltage. You can kind of see the the graphic here is we're applying pressure and the crystals are inside this, uh, we're creating a voltage, all right? And again, this is another DC voltage. Well, where will you see this? Uh, mostly right here in microphones. Okay? That's the most popular place you've probably ever seen. Your voice, the pressure from the sound waves coming out of your voice. A lot of people don't know this, but um, voice, uh, your, your, your voice, my speaking voice right now, is a transmission of vibration. Okay, that vibration is a force, okay? And that force goes into the microphone and there are crystals inside that microphone. And the pressure against these crystals creates a voltage signal out of the mic that's then converted to an audio signal out of the board and into some speakers that you can, um, you can uh, hear. But again, we're looking at another source of DC power, okay? And I'm gonna talk a lot, a lot about that, but that, that is one source of electricity. Now this next one is uh, really interesting. Um, this is called, this, we're going to use heat to create a voltage, all right? And what we've got here is a thermocouple. Now, thermocouples are used in a lot of different places. They're used in industry extensively. You've got them at your home, and some of you may have them at some of your homes, too. But basically what you've got is you've got two dissimilar metals, okay? Uh, it could be uh, copper, uh, some of them zinc, uh, iron, uh, different metals for different applications and temperature ranges but you've got two dissimilar metals. And when you twist them together, and you have a hot junction right here, and you expose that junction right there to some heat, you start to create a millivolt. Okay, millivolt meaning one thousandths of a volt. Very small signal, but very useful signal too. Okay, um, I've got a piece of, of wire right here. Okay, 
and I'm going to try to get in the camera the best I can. Hope you can see that. And you got two dissimilar metals. Okay, um, this is the copper, and this is the iron. The blue is, is being uh, is the insulation for the copper, and the red is for the iron too. Okay, and it's just a piece of wire. And as you see in the picture, in order for us to be able to get a voltage, we have to twist these together. And I've got a piece already twisted for you over here. Okay. And what I've done is I've taken this, you can see the, the blue and the red, and I've twisted them together, and that's going to be our junction point, all right? Now, unless we, if we don't twist them together, it will never read anything, it will never create a voltage. I've got a little uh, thermocouple uh, sensor, and basically just, I just put a little plug on the end of it, okay, two-prong plug, okay, and I plugged it in, and whatever this junction right here is exposed to, in this case, the room temperature in here, is what it's going to read. And right now, um, hopefully you can see this, right now we're reading a temperature of about 72 degrees, and it's roughly 72 degrees in this, in this room. Now, I could take this wire and I could stick it in a glass of ice water and it immediately drop it to 32 degrees because it's going to measure whatever the temperature is, okay, relative uh, to another junction. All right, so we got that. Now, Once I, if I touch this, for example, my temperature, again, hopefully you can read this, my temperature is going up to 75, 76. If I rub it, create a little friction there, it gets even higher. Okay, so we're around about 78 and going up to 80 degrees. If I were to, uh, this is twisted pretty tight, uh, if I were to untwist them, we would not get a voltage at all. We'd open that circuit there and we wouldn't get a voltage at all. So where do we use a thermocouple? If I'm, I, just, I just said it was so popular and everything and it's in, in, in industry and it's also used in your house. Well. Um, Right here, I've got one of these grills at my house, okay? This is one of these pellet grills. Um, I like it pretty well. Uh, you put the pellets inside the, the, uh, the uh, hopper here, and you turn it on, and it's a little screw auger, feeds it into a firebox, okay, and it lights it. And, and my controller here, if I, if I wanted this grill to be, say, 400 degrees on the inside of the chamber, there's a thermocouple uh, similar to that wire there. It's, it's, it's inside the, the chamber, and it's giving a feedback signal to the controller. And as long as, and if the chamber here is 250 degrees, but I'm wanting 400, this controller will tell the auger to keep pouring wood into the firebox and get it hotter and hotter and hotter until finally we get 400 degrees. And it's that 400 degrees is the signal being com coming back from that thermocouple. And when that 400 degrees is, is met, it stops feeding it, uh, the, the pellets, throttles it back, and you know I've got my, I maintain my temperature that way. Um, so I don't know if any of you got grills like this, but uh, another way is meat thermometers, okay? Meat thermometers are also uh, thermocouples as well. Now they've got them to where they can read them uh, through, uh, through uh, IR signals and uh, RF signals, excuse me, RF radio signals. And uh, you can tell the internal temperature of meat. I know that I've used them when I've uh, smoked some Boston Bus before. I want to know the internal temperature so I know when it's time to start pulling it off. And uh, I stick it in there and it's basically a thermocouple reading. I've actually used that meter that I showed you earlier to determine whether or not that uh, internal temperature is hot enough for me to start pulling it off. So that's a, that's a spot that you might be able to use in your home. Okay, uh, more industrial uses, uh, well, more practical uses also, uh, diesel trucks uh, will often monitor the, exact, the exhaust gas temperatures, okay? Um, my first career was in aviation. I was a jet and uh, airplane mechanic, civilian, I wasn't military, a civilian. And uh, we would measure the exhaust gas temperatures uh, in the turbine sections of, of jet engines um, on helicopters and jets, and uh, air intake in temperatures, things like that. Um, furnaces uh, and that have uh, gas or also um, uh, dryers or stoves that use gas for their heating source, okay? Uh, they use a thermocouple to, to, to detect whether or not there's a pilot flame and pilot light to light the main burn, okay? That pilot light, uh, in case some of you are not familiar with that, uh, that pilot light uh, needs to stay on and whenever it, it, the, the heating system for the house, for example, calls for more heat, the gas valve will open up, that flame will light the gas uh, and it will heat up rather quickly. Now, if you don't have that pilot light, you don't want that gas valve to open up, okay, and start filling the house full of just raw gas. You know, very dangerous, very deadly, okay? So that pilot light uh, needs to, to be on. The thermocouple is monitoring the pilot light, and while the pilot light is, is lit, something similar to that, okay, while the pilot light is lit, 
it's giving a voltage there and the controller senses that voltage and says, hey, I got a pilot light, it's safe to turn the gas valve on because it's going to light the gas when it comes on. If the flame goes out and we lose our voltage, the controller says, I'm not going to turn that gas valve on because it's, going to, it's not going to burn, it's just going to load the house up with, with gas, natural gas or propane. And so again, that's, that's very deadly and very dangerous. Um, but those are just a couple of, of uh, uh, applications that maybe you have seen or that may be around that you may not have been aware of, okay? Uh, from an industrial uh, standpoint, I used to work in the aluminum industry for a great number of years, and these are aluminum billets. They look a lot like aluminum telephone poles or aluminum logs, okay? And this is a big homogenizing furnace, okay? We've raised the temperature up of these aluminum billets so that the molecular structure can kind of realign, and it has to be uniform. The, the realigning has to be uniform through all of the billets, all right? We'd stick them in there, and we had a, a whole bunch of thermocouple wires going in there to measure the temperature at different places throughout this load of billets, okay? And that gave us an idea as to whether or not the gas burners inside, there were multiple gas burners inside, it, they, they, that they're heating it uniformly and evenly. If you don't, you're going to wind up with, with billet that's no good to the uh, customer. It's, this load of billets worth a ton of money, by the way. And um, so you want to monitor it and make sure that they're all heating up nice and evenly like they're supposed to, okay? So we use thermocouple wires for that as well. And what we do is we'd measure the, the heat inside that and we'd bring it back to a computer and we could look at the computer and monitor that. But it's all coming from a millivolt signal on a piece of thermocouple wire back to the computer, okay? So uh, that, that's an application that I use. Now the final one that we're going to talk about is the mag using magnetism as a source of electricity, okay? And as you can see by this graphic here, what we're doing, this is a permanent magnet with a north and a south end, okay? And this is a coil of wire, okay? <clears throat> if you learn nothing more out of this class or the whole program about electricity, 98% of it involves magnetism created by coils of wire, whether it's a transformer, whether it is a motor starter, a control relay, uh, a, a, a motor itself, okay? We are using solenoids, we're using coils of wire to create a magnetic field. Now, this coil of wire, a coil of wire is simply one piece of wire that's wrapped around and around and around and around with a beginning, goes around and around and an end, okay? And we've got it hooked to a little galvanometer, which is like a, like a voltage, a small, small uh, voltmeter. Okay? And as we pass that permanent magnet through the uh, coil of wire, a voltage is induced. What we're doing is, is the magnetic lines of, the lines of flux or magnetic field is being induced into the uh, coils of wire. We're going to get into the science behind that in our next lecture. But for right now, just passing this magnet through the coil of wire induces a voltage in the coil of wire and we get a voltage read. Okay? Now, there's another way you can do that. You can do it uh, just the opposite. Instead of passing the magnet through the coil of wire, we can pass the coil of wire through the magnet. So this is a permanent magnet with a north and a south, and our magnetic lines of flux are these red lines right here. Okay? That's the magnetism, the lines of flux, the field, going between north and south. If we take a piece of wire, and that's what this rotating piece right here, if we pass that, that uh, conductor right here, this, this wire, through and, the, and cut the lines of flux of this magnetic field, a voltage is induced in this wire, okay, this conductor. And then we can use some slip rings to then get it out to where we can use it. Okay? This is the principle behind the, uh, the, the large uh, power generation stations, you know, TVA, Big Rivers, and things like that, places like that. Uh, they're using this exact same principle. Now, we're not, they're not using permanent magnets. Okay, but they're using a magnetic field and the magnetic force that we'll talk about when we get into alternators. But my point is, is that you can create a voltage either by moving a magnet through a coil of wire or you can move a coil of wire through a magnetic field. Either way, it will induce a voltage that we can use and that we use to create a voltage in use. Okay, here's another one, very simple. Okay, again, this is a conductor, the black part is a conductor. Okay, we've got a couple of slip rings right here. And notice that it's cutting the magnetic, the green um, lines of uh, flux, magnetic lines of flux, the field, and it's inducing a voltage, and we get a, the AC voltage, a positive and a negative of our alter, of alternating current. Now, you'll notice about the one thing about the uh, magnet, uh, excuse me, the, the uh, magnetic uh, form of um, producing power 
it creates alternating current. All the others that we've talked about so far, our chemical, our pressure, our heat, our light, they all created direct current, DC, okay? When we are moving uh, a magnetic, uh, or a conductor through a magnetic field, or vice versa, we're creating alternating current, okay? That's where industry runs, okay? It uses 95% of it, I'm, I'm, it's, I'm roughly speaking, uh, is used using AC, okay? We do use DNC, DC in some applications, but we're not going to talk about it in this particular lecture. It's a whole other uh, lesson for that. But that is how we create voltage using magnetism, okay? And like I said before, this simple little model right here is the very principle that the major power plants, the big power plants, whether it's hydroelectric, uh, whether it's coal-fired nuclear, um, all of them use uh, a, a large al uh, alternator that's built off the principle of this, and it creates an AC voltage, okay? And again, that's what comes out of our power plants is the AC voltage, all right? So anyway, for right now, that's, what, that's all we got for you right now. Um, I hope you've been taking notes. Uh, again, the notes uh, from the lecture, the notes from the reading or the highlighting, whichever you prefer, and also the, the notes from the lab will be critically important. Again, guys, I can't tell you enough, this is not going to go away. This lecture that I just did, we're going to build on all of it, going in the second, third, and fourth, and this class builds on the others. So be sure to take notes. If you have any questions, or something that you're not understanding in your reading or in the lab or on my lectures or something, by all means, come uh, look me up in the lab. Give me a call on my, on, uh, my office phone. Uh, all of that's on Blackboard in the syllabus. Uh, and, or find me uh, in my office, and, or you can email me. Uh, but get a hold of me. Don't struggle. We'll talk through it. We'll get you up to speed. Make sure you understand everything because I want you to be successful in this class. But anyway, this is just kind of an overview of, of the five sources of power that we're going to uh, that we want to study a little bit. We're going to get start breaking them down and really focusing particularly on AC and the alternators in the next lesson. But that's all I got for you right now. I uh, hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you for watching. And again, if you need any help or anything, just find me and I'll be glad to help you. Anyway, thanks a lot and we'll see you in the lab.